Andrew Wilson is the Area Technical Manager Rail at Scunthorpe for British Steel uh, and he's going to talk to us about the history of rail steels. So over to you Andrew. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Am I coming through clear? Perfect. Yep, right. loud and. Thank you for the introduction Sue. Um, that, as Sue said, I'm Andrew Wilson. I've been working uh, for, for British Steel in, in the rail business since 2006. Uh, when we really fought, first rolled the first rail at Scunthorpe. So historic, we've got a long history with rail steels and, and rail production in British Steel dating back maybe 130 years, but it was previously done at uh, Workington in Cumbria. And in 2006, the Workington rail mill closed and we moved production to Scunthorpe rail and section mill, which is where I work. So from, from the beginning of rail steel in Scunthorpe, I've been there a bit of a rail nerd gets under your skin and, and it's quite addictive so I'm just going to turn the video off you don't want to see my big bald head through all of this and share my presentation just bear with me a moment can everyone see that yeah that looks okay Andrew I've got full screen view Okay, so we're going to we're going to talk today about some of the um, the history of of rail steels. It, it's a relatively simple carbon steel metallurgy, but but it has uh, it has some some changes throughout history which we're going to cover today and try and make it interesting and entertaining as I can. Um, where's my mouse gone? There it is. So we're going to cover the uh, the history of rail steel developments, some rail steel metallurgy basics for the non-metallurgists. But I think that with this audience, you're all pretty much material scientists, I believe. So uh, we'll 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 fly through that. Some of the current rail steel families that are available in the world at the moment. Uh, we'll finish with some rail joint technology, and I'll explain why that's important later. And then we'll do a bit of a deeper dive into the anomaly of of a, of a particular type of weld to explain why. Uh, it's not all about the metallurgy. So we start right back at the beginning then. So where is the beginning? So you could say that the railways began with, with locomotion, but actually guided transport, guided wheel transport has been around for a very long time. Some of the earliest um, guided wheel transport systems are, are actually made out of, of stone. So this, this one here is from Pompeii. It's uh, excavated maybe uh, 20 years ago. It's a, it's a section of sunken wagon way in the streets of Pompeii. And you can see that the stonemason has, has took the time that those have not worn into the into the stone. They've been chiseled into the stone to provide a, a, a guide for the wheels of wagons along this guide, guided wagon way. Uh, you can see there's a large stone in the center there. And we the archaeologists believe that was because these got sunken guide, guide ways would filled with water when it rained and and this allowed people to step step across like a stepping stone without getting the feet wet so you can start to imagine that the axle height of the wagons has to be above that stone and you can start to build a picture in your mind of what these these wagons would look like we go a bit later in 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 time into the 18th century you would often find guided wagon ways for where you had to move freight and goods a shuttle run backwards and forwards between two points. So if you consider a mine, for example, with um, mining tin ore, and you need to get that tin ore to the smelters, you might have a, a particular run backwards and forwards. And if you were to just use normal horse-drawn wagons, you would deteriorate the roads. And um, in, in wet conditions, you would have mud and all kinds of, of, of issues pre preventing transport. So they started to develop gu guided wagon ways you, very crudely with hardwood timber wheel guides but uh, they they susceptible to weathering and, and wear and they would deteriorate very quickly so to give them some longevity you would you would often see um wrought iron ang angle sections or or cast iron plates that have just been screwed on nailed onto a, a lump of hardwood to give a very crude rail if you like 
um, you, this would all be horse drawn or even man pulled or even sometimes gravity fed um, systems for moving freight about. Once you started to introduce locomotives into the equation, obviously hardwood rails are not going to be suitable. You know, lo steam engines, the early ones and then the later ones, they, they're in incredibly heavy machines. You know, they have fireboxes and boilers, gallons and gallons of water, you know, maybe a ton, a ton and a half of coal on some of the, the lighter ones. They, they exert quite a lot of pressure and, and the material needs to be strong enough to resist that. So one of the earliest attempts at a, at a rail, as we, we understand them today, is this. It's a cast iron fish belly rail. These are actually at the York Railway Museum. If you can, next time you visit, you, you can perhaps pop outside and have a look at these. They're cast iron sections between two and three foot long, and they were designed to span between sleepers, hardwood timber sleepers, uh, typically. At the, at the midpoint of the span, though, that's where you have the largest bending moment. And of course, the running surface has to be flat and straight. So they would they designed them to sort of belly out so that you'd got some additional stiffness in the middle to resist the the, the bending moment and, and to give you some resistance to fracture, uh, cast iron not being the toughest of materials, as we all know. Interestingly, if you take a section through the middle of the of the rail there, you can see on, on the right hand side, it, it starts to look a bit like um, an I beam, how, how we, you know, how we would imagine it's exactly how how you, how you can picture it. But at, at the ends, if you take a section through the ends, well, it starts to look something that we would recognize today as a more modern rail. And you can see how this shape has evolved. Um, fish bellied rails had a very short lived life. Obviously, you need kilometers. Of, of track for even a modest railway and you know individually cast two to three foot sections it's not very economically viable it's very slow and difficult manufacturing route and the material is 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 not not ideal but it was the available technology at the time and during the napoleonic wars uh, there was a lot of foundries making making cannons etc so the, the technology was widely available at the time and that's why you would see uh, the preferred material for a complex shape. So cast iron then. Uh, cast iron at the time, relatively crude, per perlite, coarse perlite colonies, uh, grain boundary cementite, and leather burrite, transformed leather burrite, uh, microstructure, very, very coarse structure very brittle and very low toughness but reasonably strong you know you get a reasonable hardness out of it 210 brunel hardness but poor toughness and that was its downfall and if we go back uh, just just one slide you can imagine you fracture one of these and you've derailed the train you know it's a, it's a large piece of your railway to have missing from one fracture and it, it's a costly incident that so uh, poor safety due to the incredibly low toughness and also not workable so you can't you can't get a very long piece by by rolling it or working it it's cast iron has its limitations so it had a short-lived tenure and it was uh, excluded as, as something that's just not viable oh, because because rail is an intrinsically long product and the longer the better it was obvious from the beginning that you needed to produce a rolled profile and for, for that at the time the available technology was low carbon wrought iron it it would allow you then to, to put them through a simple rolling mill, get a, a, a length, maybe 15 foot, 20 foot, maybe even up to 30 foot in, in the later years. Uh, and that's a sort of length of rail that starts to become more credible and more attractive. And the costs start to come down as the railways then start to pro uh, propagate through through the country and become more popular. Obviously, cost is is an important driver. Uh, the trouble with these rolled iron rails, and you can see there's a couple of diagrams in the bottom left, they sat in a cast iron shoe and that the cast iron shoe was the preferred method for affixing them to the sleepers and holding them upright on these early rails. But the problem with this, these low, low carbon steels is that they have re relatively low strength and locomotives, heavy contraptions, as we discussed earlier, and they're getting heavier as well as, as time passes, they're more powerful, heavier loads being pulled and you quickly overwhelm the material strength. So 
I've got a, an image I've just put on the screen. That's actually a rail from the 1950s, but it helped prove my point. Apologies, there's an alarm, uh, an alarm going off in the background, uh, re reversing the train. So apologies for that. The um, the rail you see there, it's a sulfur print of a rail, and you can see that you've lost the symmetrical shape of the rail. You've got a round corner on the field side, which is the side facing the the opposite rail, on on the gauge side, sorry, but on the field side of the, the corner, you've got quite a sharp corner of the rail head. And, and what, what's happened there is you've got plastic flow of the material. It's, it's deformed, it's flowed across away from the, from, the, from the gauge side, and you've got um, a, a, a loss of your profile shape and, and some mushrooming, and, and it's, it's been overwhelmed by the, by the demands that have been put on it. So subsequent passes of trains, each train is, is exerting a an axle load in, in the UK main mainline traffic is about 22 tonnes per, per axle and it's a five pence piece sized contact patch so you can imagine the pressures are enormous and it's subsequent axles pass over the rails they start to cold roll it effectively and, and mushroom it out so increased strength resists this loss of, of of profile that results from the plastic deformation so we've got to drive the strength up into the 19th century then, the mid-19th century, the uh, Industrial Revolution is really starting to motor at this point and uh, the steel making technology is improving. So we start to see Bessemer steels, open hearth steels, cleaner steel making technologies. And they're also more economic steel making technology. So again, as the railways become cheaper and more available, they start to expand and become more widespread across the country, across the continent, across the world. And it's facilitated by this improvement in the cost effectiveness, which is driven by the technology. Once you've got cleaner steels with lower phosphorus and things like lower sulfur, then you can start to add a bit more carbon and refine your steel a bit better. And here you can see 0.25% uh, carbon steel. So you, you start to have a, a ferrite perlite microstructure. Uh, again, you've got that strength benefit over wrought iron which is giving you that resistance to the plastic deformation that is, that is desirable and giving you that hardness as well. So with, with increased strength comes increased hardness and more wear resistance. So it's important to realize that on the, the curves, you get a lot of wear. Uh, all trains have fixed axles. So when you get to a, a curve, the inside track is obviously shorter, but the axle is fixed, there's no differential. So you get some slippage under load and that's what wears away the, the material. So increasing that strength gives you more resistance. What you can also see at the bottom of this screen is that uh, from the first Bessemer rolled rails in 1865 in the United States, what's happened as time has progressed is that the rails have got heavier in pounds per yard or uh, kilograms per meter in, in Europe. And they've also got taller and stiffer. And again, this is all about the increase in weight of the trains. You know, as as trains have got more popular, you want more productivity, more throughput, more tonnage carried. They get heavier, they get longer, they get more demanding on the material. So the rails themselves get taller and stiffer and give you that stiffness to uh, allow you to have a wider or a more cost effective sleeper spacing and to span span those effectively and to take the weight of the trains. Into the 20th century then, we start to see BOSS process steel making, particularly in Europe, taking taking over as the preferred method for rail steel manufacture. And obviously with, with the BOSS process, you get a further improvement in um, steel cleanliness, in your uh, composition control, and you're able to go even higher on the carbon scale. The trouble is you start to get to higher carbon levels. Hydrogen starts to become more of a problem for, for shatter cracking and, and delayed hydrogen cracking. So we have to introduce some, some methodology to control the hydrogen, which initially was just ingot slow cooling. They would cast the ingots and then stack them all up in a pile and, and put like a refractory line shed over the top of them just to slow cool them and allow that hydrogen to diffuse out. Nowadays, we have uh, more modern, slightly more modern methods of vacuum degassing, but we'll come on to that. Um, here you can see the microstructure. Now the dominant phase has become perlite and you just have some grain boundary ferrite, just diffuse and, and uh, maybe a continuous network, but it's, it's 
it's a minimal part of the microstructure. Again, you've, what you see from just adding more carbon is that you get the increased strength, the increased hardness, um, toughness, less important in rail steels. It's, it's not uh, all rail steels, even modern rail steels, you would not call them ductile, but they're not designed to be. They're always in compression under ser in service. They're always um, heavy axle weight on a, on a small contact patch. The, it's the material science needs to focus on the on the um, contact energy and resisting that. Not only has the, well, we haven't finished by the way, but not only have we increased the strength of the alloying and, and the carbon levels and the, the, the imp improved the, the material properties, the technology has also improved. So at the top left there, we, we introduced continuous casting. In the UK, it became mandatory for all rail steels in 1976 to be manufactured from continuous cast blooms. And it was a quantum leap forward in, in rail safety. So ingot casting introduced a lot of problems. You would have uh, pipe defects in the ingots. You would have a lot of inclusions. You would have a top and a bottom of the ingot with different levels of performance, you know, from one end of the rail to the other. When they introduced continuous cast bloom manufactured rail steels, there was a step change um, improvement in, in the number of rail breaks from internal defects and fatigue cracks from internal stress raises, inclusions, non-metallic inclusions, pipe, for example, and porosity. The top right, you can see universal rolling of rail was was introduced. So universal rolling is is rolling it in two planes simultaneously. So you have vertical spindle rolls there and horizontal spindle rolls there. And what this allows you to do is control the dimensions incredibly accurately. And that's most important for higher speed railways. For example, the TGV network in France, 320 kilometer an hour cruising speed. You know, you need to have a very dimensionally accurate rail because rail to rail, when you join them, you need to have a consistent dimensions. So you don't end up with a little step or misalignment of your welds. But also um, the, the tolerances have got tighter as well. So rails, for example, let me give you an example. Structural sections, 203 by 203 millimeter universal columns. The flange length tolerance today is plus four millimeters minus two millimeters. So I've got a six millimeter tolerance range to work within and I've got a compliance section. Rails by comparison is plus or minus 0.5 millimeters on the rail height dimension from the top of the head to the bottom of the foot. So it's an order of magnitude tighter tolerances for dimensions. And that's not just at the ends, that's for the full 120 meter rail we produce all the way down its length. It's got to be within that tolerance band and, and it's, it's, it's important for the for the ride comfort, the running surface, the, the height of the rail. You know, you don't want a lumpy, bumpy rail if you're going to be flying across it at very high speeds. In the bottom left corner, you see we've got a ladle arc furnace and some secondary steel making activities going on. That's now mandatory in modern steel making specifications. But what that allows you to do is control the temperature arriving at the caster very well. You can refine the chemistry to very tight control levels. You can bubble argon through it and make it homogeneous. Uh, you can get better quality steel. The, the bottom middle picture is not a great picture actually, but that's actually a, one of our vacuum degassers. So it's a it's a tank with two snor snorkels on it that we lower into the ladle of steel, about 300 tons at our ladles at Scunthorpe. Then you suck uh, all the air out of the tank above and it, take it to a very low vacuum and the atmospheric pressure pushes the steel up into the tank. And then through one of the snorkel legs, you bubble argon, which, which lowers the density in that snorkel and causes it to rise. And then the, it, that creates a current with the other leg of the snorkel, which, which falls. And you turn over the 300 tons of steel many times in maybe a 30 minute treatment and exposing it all to the vacuum and suck out the hydrogen from that is picked up through the process and get the hydrogen levels right down. And again, that's, that's very important for reducing the number of rail breaks and improving the safety of the railway. And then finally, in the bottom right hand is the mandatory ultrasonic inspection we do now for new rails. So every millimeter of every rail I want to sell here from Scunthorpe, I have to ultrasonically test. And we have 18 probes at Scunthorpe, three, three on the foot, three on the head, three each side of the rail head, and then six in the web. And six in the web because the last bit of the 
uh, continuously cast bloom to solidify is where the dirt tends to end up. So that ends up in the in the center of the rail. That's why we inspect there the most. So these are some of the problems from the older rail. So th this uh, type of fatigue crack here in this rail brake is called a tashaval. So it's a particular type of fatigue crack defect, which is from an internal stress razor, and it's fatigued from the inside out. So this one is from shatter cracks from hydrogen. So there's a little hydrogen crack there, and then you've had this fatigue crack grow, and it's grown to quite a large size, actually. It's, it speaks well of the steel that it's got quite so large before it's br brittle failed. Here you can see uh, poor internal soundness from, from a pipe defect in a pre-1976 rail, which has caused the rail to split. And another Toshaval here from a, a non-metallic inclusion within the steel before, prior to mandatory ultrasonic inspection. So again, a stress razor internal and it's cracked from the inside out. And you can see that field side flow on this uh, on this image as well, with, with the sharp corner and the round corner. It's, a, it's, it's surprisingly common, that. OK, in the late 20th century, then, we get to the eutectoid point carbon level, so fully perlitic rail steels. Um, typically, Scunthorpe R260 grade rail steel is 0.73 to 0.75 carbon level, uh, fully, fully perlitic, as I mentioned. And this has really become, when it was originally um, created, this grade, it was seen as as wear resistant, you know, as a premium rail steel. But as, as things have moved on, this has become the standard rail standard grade, if you like, and, and probably 80 to 90% of everything we produce at Scunthorpe is R260 grade. It's the dominant rail grade across Europe and a lot of our export orders as well. It's become the workhorse of the rail industry, this grade, and this is another advantage of the standardization across the industry as well. You know, back in the, in the 19th century, every single railway had their own rail profile, their own rail steel grade. You know, there was no standardization and it became um, expensive. Once you introduce standardization and you, you adopt a profile for a, a given country and say this is going to be the standard profile for the UK or Germany or wherever and then you you commoditize it, it becomes there's more competition and market forces drive the price down. So R260 grade is a fantastic rail steel. It's well understood because it's widely used and adopted. It's, it's easy to weld. It, it's it, it's the workhorse. Further improvements in the in the late twentieth century was from heat treating. So so perlitic rail steels. If you accelerate cool the rail through the range of about eight hundred degrees down to about five hundred degrees, you you can force it to transform at a lower temperature, and it puts more energy into the into the transformation uh, kinetics, and you end up with a finer perlite. And you can, by accelerated cooling it aggressively through that temperature range, you can get a very, very fine perlite, which is harder and stronger with only a minimal loss in, in ductility. You, you maybe lose 1% of elongation, but you, you gain um, 90 Brunel hardness. So it's, it's a big leap forward for, for heat treated rails, but, but the, it comes with some problems and we'll, we'll discuss that later. But these two grades are widely adopted across Europe as a standard grade and then a premium rail grade. And the smartest operators at networks, they'll use things like R260 grade in the tangent track, straight line track where you don't get a lot of wear. And they might choose to use a premium rail grade like R350HT somewhere like your curves um, on the main line or tight curves or freight lines, for example, where the, where the contact energy is higher. So I'm sure you're all familiar with the iron carbon phase diagram. I've just brought it up here because we want to use the, the X axis for a moment. So just to recap, we started with cast irons in this green region and, and quickly discounted those. Then we went to the other end, right down to the, to the bottom here with the wrought irons, and we gradually worked our way up the, up the hypo eutectoid scale until we've reached the eutectoid. The only place we haven't been now is hyper eutectoid rail steels. And <laughs> you guessed it, that's where we're going next. So in this millennium, the latest generation of rail steels are hyper eutectoid. So our Austrian friends in Verstalpine, one of our competitors, they developed a grade uh, last decade called R400HT. 
It's a nearly 1% carbon rail steel, uh, quite a lot of manganese, little tiny bit of chrome, and it's aggressively heat treated. And they yield a, a for, typical 420 Brunel hardness. This is, this is a super premium rail grade targeted specifically at very heavy haul railway lines like in Brazil, where they're moving iron ore about. Um, just heavy freight trains with maybe 35 to 40 ton axle weights, you know, double the UK mainline capacity, just, just incredible demanding areas to, to operate a railway. And, and th these super premium grades are targeted at that. The problem with hyper-eutectoid rail steels is that you often, as it's, as it's cooling down and it, and it transforms, you, you pass this through this little triangle here and you form continuous networks of grain boundary cementite which is deleterious to the performance. It, it, it acts as a fracture path and, and it makes the fatigue cracks or any cracks flow very quickly through it. It lowers the toughness and it's undesirable. So the way that Verst Alpine get around that with their R400HT grade is they accelerate cool it aggressively through this little triangle here. So it spends a minimum amount of time in it and it forms only very thin and broken and diffuse um, grain boundary cementite. But you can see when etched in perlite or look viewed under your SEM, you, it's not really resolvable. But actually, if you etch it in sodium picrate at maybe 80 degrees, and you can actually resolve this. You see it's thin, but it is very much there. The other thing to say is they only really heat treat the head. So the web, the foot of the steel is very, very coarse, continuous networks of grain boundary cementite. And it's not, it's not the way we choose to do it. So the other widely available uh, hyper-eutectoid grade on the market has been developed by British Steel, and that's uh, R335V is its modern new name, but it's uh, branded high performance or HP rail steel. This is a um, 0.9% carbon alloyed steel. We have quite high silicon at 0.88, maybe 0.9% silicon. And we have 0.1% uh, vanadium in there. So it's a carbon high silicon vanadium steel. Now, what the what the silicon does is it actually lifts this A1 line and it squashes this triangle, if you like. So we can we if you if you trace up here, we're only at a very small temperature range anyway, but by lifting this A1, we squash it further and we actually suppress the grain boundary cementite formation almost entirely by alloying. And where does that carbon end up? Well, you end up with a higher volume fraction percentage of cementite within your perlite, which is desirable for the performance without a particular drop in, in its um, crack propagation rate. So these are the two um, hyper-eutectoid grades available in Europe at the moment widely. Uh, different applications. This is more of a rival for R350HT, a premium mixed traffic rail, and it outperforms it, I should say, not that I'm biased or anything, whereas R400 is targeted more for your super heavy haul. So perlite then, we've talked a lot about perlite. Why is perlite the preferred microstructure? So uh, there's a lot of metallurgy minded people on this call, and I, I, won't, I won't bore you with the details, but for those who aren't familiar, it's a a, a two-part lamellar structure comprising of cementite, which is iron carbide, and, and ferrite. It's like a composite material, and it forms a transformation, usually after hot rolling. We don't roll it as cold as that, so we, we finish about maybe 980 degrees. Uh, the transformation happens on the cooling bank somewhere, and, and it, these nodules, these uh, colonies of perlite grow from the priorostonite grain boundaries in a random orientation. So presented to the to the wheel on the running surface, you have randomly orientated colonies of, of perlite. However, in service, even um, even with the increased strength, you do get some plastic deformation of the surface layer. And this is a, a, a curved section of tracks. There's a little bit of slip here, and you can see that deeper down into the bulk microstructure, you've got uh, just randomly orientated perlite colonies, but nearer the surface, you get this wire drawing type. If you think of a high carbon wire steels, where they draw them down to, to really boost the strength, you can get something crazy like uh, 2000 megapascal tensile strength on, on deep drawn high carbon 
wires for, for bridge cables, we, we're getting the same effect at the surface of the rail. So all of the perlite lamellae are aligning with the deformation. And you end up with a, uh, a particular angle not, uh, relative to the surface. But it, it work hardens to an incredibly high level, and that gives you this increased wear resistance at the surface, which is why perlite has such good wear performance compared to other microstructures such as tempered mar martensite. So you could maybe get a tempered martensite structure with a 400 Brunel hardness, but on, uh, under surface, at the end of the day, it's a ferrite matrix with um, with cementite spheres distributed widely throughout it, and they spall out at the surface and, and, and don't add much strength. And you're really just working on the properties of the, of the, of the ferrite. There are some bayonetic steels under development, but they've been under development for 30 years and they really haven't got much traction. And the wear performance is poor but tolerable. So it's, it's for a 320 minimum Brunel bayonetic steel, it, it actually wears faster than a 260 minimum Brunel perlitic steel, but only just. But they come with additional problems. So while they're excellent resistant to rolling contact fatigue cracking, they're, they're very susceptible to stress corrosion cracking and also uh, self-propagating cracks with no fatigue cycle, just the, the sort of things you don't want in a railway. They make it incredibly risky and, and they just haven't got any traction. So perlite will continue to remain the dominant microstructure, I believe, in this industry for the next, certainly, my, my career. All we've talked about so far, though, is just increasing the strength and increasing the hardness, but hardness isn't always better. So there are, there are two degradation mechanisms, really. You have wear. So in high contact energy environments like heavy haul or sharp corners, you end up with abrasion being the dominant wear factor. And cracks can never really take hold because the wear rate exceeds the crack propagation rate. So you just have a wear dominated environment. It, it can become exponential as well. So you lose the profile, the design profile, and then you end up with a suboptimal fit of your wheel to rail interaction. And that increases the, the contact energy, decreases the size of your contact patch, and that makes the wear even worse and it spirals. You can see here, that there's not virtually nothing left of the rail head on that one, it's, it's incredible. However, in some of the uh, very, very slight curves where you still have some slip but a very low wear rate, fatigue cracks start to dominate. So if we go back to this um, uh, worked and deformed perlite here at the surface, at, at the very surface, the, the cementite starts to smash off and just become wear debris. And you end up with a, a ferrite surface which ratchets up and forms lips and then those lips fold over create a stress razor and you, you have a crack forming and that crack then it follows these lines of deformation back down in a predictable manner they grow at a predictable rate until they reach a certain depth and when they get down to the randomly orientated perlite then they start to behave unpredictably they often turn down and you can get rapid unpredictable failure so you have a layer with which to manage your cracks within and if you manage them and grind off that material you you can extend the life of the rail considerably however in a metro environment like london underground for example if you put an incredibly hard rail like an r400 ht you would get nowhere you would get no deformation or it would be very very slow and the, the cracks would start to form and then they would turn down immediately so Harder isn't always better. You've got to pick the material properties based on the application. As as ever, with everything, it's a complex it's a complex thing. So how do you manage that? Well, the solution to both loss of profile from wear and cracks is train based grinding. Milling as well. Milling is becoming more popular, but but grinding is is the dominant way of of, of managing rail defects. So I take one of these trains, they've got a series of grinding stones on, on the underside and you'll give them a pass of the track, removing maybe 0 0.2, 0 0.3 millimetres of the steel. And if the cracks are one millimetre deep, you might need several passes in order to clear, clear the, the cracks and reprofile the rail. And that's how you manage the, the railway to, to get maximum life out of your asset. <laughs> 
if you allow the cracks to grow and become unpredictable and have rapid failure and, and premature failure, whereas you, you maybe have 12, 13 millimeters of material lost through grinding before you have to change the rail and that, that could be decades. I mean, a, a rail in tangent track can last 50, 60 years in, in, in the network if maintained properly. So just have a very quick recap. So I realize I've been waffling for a bit. Um, as trains have got heavier and faster, the rail steels have had to get stronger, harder, much cleaner, and of course, to facilitate all the above lower hydrogen. But as trains have got heavier and faster, rails have had to get taller and stiffer with tighter dimensional tolerances, but also longer. We haven't mentioned joints. The, the longer the supplied rail is, from the manufacturer, the fewer joints per kilometre you have, and the joints are always the weak points. So there's, a, there's a, a, a hunger from the industry to have longer, longer and supplied length. We'll just quickly look into the two rail alloy families then. So you have two types of rail steel, really, that we've settled on across the world. Uh, Non-alloyed carbon steels, so carbon manganese steels with a bit of silicon. It's very simple steel in a range of carbon levels within the European spec and then alloyed and what they typically mean by alloyed is chrome so this particular grade R320 chrome it's one percent chrome it was a precursor to heat treatment so they were trying to develop a, a premium rail before heat treatment technology was widely available nobody uses it anymore it's been 320 chrome grade has been superseded by heat treated and it was virtually unweldable as well very very hardenable grade very intolerant of um, a very only tolerant of a very narrow cooling window, so welding was very difficult. We, we also put in that bracket HP, although it really technically is microalloyed and it's, it's a bit of an outlier. It sits outside the normal um, design philosophies. Non-alloyed also comes in a heat treat variants, and also alloyed comes in heat treat variants. So why, would, if you've got these two options, alloyed and non-alloyed rail steels? Why choose one over the other? It's the same in the American specification. You have a, a carbon steel, which is your carbon manganese steels and your, your chromium alloyed, and then a range of strength levels, which is just varying levels of heat treatment. So the pros for al chromium alloying, you improve the properties. You actually strengthen the ferrite within the perlite. So you're getting some microscopic performance benefits at the surface interaction. Uh, you actually get improved rolling contact fatigue resistance. It's it, it's marginal, but it, it is documented. You can customize your chemistry and your hardness levels a bit more with, with some of the um, customer, uh, com supplier branded products such as MHH from our former friends in, in Hyange. You get better flash book weld heat affected zone hardness. So for a given cooling rate, you can get a harder perlite with chromium alloys because on your carbon, on your continuous cooling diagram, it shifts your perlite nose to the right. So you end up with a, a finer perlite for a given cooling rate. So it, it does improve the the hardness of your welds, critical HAZ, which is desirable in some heat treated grades. And we'll explain that later. The cons though, increased costs. It's not a vastly expensive alloy chrome, but you know, when you're, you're buying thousands of tons of this stuff, it's um, you know incremental costs like that do mount up and it does increase the hardenability so you lower that tolerance to a wide range of cooling rates so it means that the welding becomes more critical that it's controlled precisely so while we're talking about welding we should also just quickly talk about jointing of rails so traditionally rails were joined by uh, bolted joints, fish, fish plate bolted joints, as you can see in the top left there. The trouble with bolted joints are you get a lot of dynamic loading. You, you, you uh, recognize the, the clickety clack sound from a, a bolted railway. That distinctive clickety clack is actually battering the rail end. You can perhaps see on the, the left hand rail at the top there, there's a bit of a, a, bit, a bit of a lip on it where it's been hammered by hammer blows by each axle that passes across it. You also have to lubricate them and maintain them and check the torque at the on the bolts regularly and they're quite maintenance intensive. Uh, the reason you need to lubricate them is because they do slide with 
uh, thermal expansion of the of the railway f for temperature differences. So they do accommodate that, but it does it does give you sliding. Uh, it might only be a few millimeters, but it, it needs to be lubricated. Otherwise, you get some fretting. The top right, you see the uh, one of the more common welding methods. It's it's thermite welding. So you have a um, aluminothermitic powder within a crucible you build a mold around a gap between two rails you want to join maybe an inch gap you build a mold around it you put this crucible on top you light the blue touch paper and retire 10 paces a lot of sparks fly and it casts iron out with some alloying in, in, within the powder it's, it's a bit more than just cast iron it's quite 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 clever really the technology behind it nowadays but you fill that gap with um liquid steel that's cast into there and then you let it solidify and you've joined the rails that way and then you just grind it back to a seamless joint afterwards that's very common it's very portable so it's, it's it's dominant really because of its portability and at the bottom is is flash butt welding which we'll talk a bit more about now so flash flash butt welding is is the most reliable weld, weld joint you can have in the railway uh, particularly depot flash butt welding. So you do get mobile flash butt welders, but the, the depot flash butt welding is highly automated process. We have one here in Scunthorpe and we do take two 108 meter rails and weld them together into a 216 meter string before disp dispatching them to network rail for, for um, re-railing activities within the network here. So we're, we're quite familiar with this process because we do operate it. Um, what you can do in the in the depot is uh, any thermal distortion you've got from the high heat input we can press that we've got a press we can we can correct that and, and we can, we've got an auto grinder to grind flush the the running surface so it, it the rail doesn't see any difference it see sorry the wheel doesn't see any difference it just sees parent metal ground smooth uh, very very reliable jointing method just quickly look at the um anatomy of a flash butt weld so here you can see a macro this is a slice through the middle of the weld that line down the middle is the fusion line it's it's decarburized slightly so you have some grain boundary ferrite networks continuous grain boundary ferrite networks which is giving it that lighter color either side of the fusion line you have a uh, the critical heat affected zone and then you have this light gray zone and then we return to the bulk the, the dots you can see along the top of the macro are actually Vickers hardness indents. So we take a hardness indent across the, the weld, and this is all part of the approval process for the weld, welding plant. So here, here's what that hardness profile looks like for a HP rail. So you can see the parent is typically, I don't know, 355 Vickers there, and you can see the different zones within it. So if we overlay the, the macro, and we look at the critical heat affected zone what you can see here is you've got a boost in hardness so what's happening after the, after the the weld the predominant cooling mechanism is conduction it's conducting heat away down the length of the rail and the rate at which it, it conducts heat away is proportional to how much preheating you've done so if you put a bigger reservoir of heat in the rail ends you can slow that cooling rate and you can reduce this hardness and we can play tunes with this by altering the parameters of the process but it does accelerate cool akin to heat treatment compared to the bulk rail hardness or the edges of the graph so you do have an improved hardness on your air cooled grades finer perlite so you back to the iron carbon phase diagram you can see that we, we heat up during welding into the austenite region. We re the steel. The carbon goes back into solution. We then weld, weld them together, forge weld them together, maybe 150 ton forging pressure. We then allow it to cool and it retransforms, but at a faster rate than previously. So we end up with a finer perlite. Then we have the intercritical heat affected zone that's this light gray region where you have a massive drop in the hardness so what's happening here is that uh, you're getting some spheroidization of your perlite and it's important to minimize the width of these zones because they're unavoidable 
but the narrower they are, the more chance your contact patch of your wheel running along the rail has to just step over it. You know, you have a hard critical heat effect zone and then you parent either side and you just bridge over it. So it's important to keep them narrow. If you don't keep them narrow, then you end up with defects like this. So you have a, a, a crack network that's formed and started to spall out from the spheridized region. And that's because it's too wide. So you're getting too much of the contact energy operating on the weakest part of the steel. So what's happening in this region then? Well, we're heating the steel up here to at and around the transformation point and you decompose the perlite partially austenitize the steel but not fully and you spheridize the the perlite that you do have and you end up with a big drop in the hardness because ferrite becomes the more dominant phase and then just here the subcritical heat affected zone you, you, the hardness returns back to the bulk you do have some um slight decomposition of the perlite does the, the lamellae start to break and up break up and shorten you get some spheridization but the further away from the weld you get the lower temperature and the more and more like the bulk microstructure so why have i just told you all of that well the region is, the reason is a railway is only as strong as its weakest point so you can design a rail steel like this one for example is a 400 brunel hardness rail heat treated but it's only going to perform as well as its weakest bit. And here, the critical heat affected zone on these my, um, on these chromium alloys, the heat treated steels, is lower than the parent. So it doesn't really matter what the hardness is at the parent steel. It can be 400 Vickers here. It could be 450 Vickers. It doesn't matter. The, the maintenance frequencies are going to be determined by the weld, the bit that performs the worst. So it's super important to consider the welding as part of the system. Um, you know, the bulk properties of the rail are irrelevant if you, if you don't get a good weld. And that's where the heat treated rails let themselves down a little bit. The, the critical heat affected zone is always slightly weaker than the parent. And they become the dominant factor in deciding your maintenance frequencies. Whereas if you go back to HP, you can see that the critical heat affected zone is always harder than the par the parent and therefore it's never the factor that lets the, ra the rail down. So that was my parting for thought really. I think I've waffled on for, for long enough now and uh, be glad to take any of your questions. Okay, uh, if anybody has any uh, questions, can they put them into the chat box please? Um, my father was very much involved in uh, rail steel wear. He worked at Swindon Laboratories in the days of the United Steel Companies. And one of my paperweights here is a piece of Workington Iron and uh, Workington Iron and Steel Company. It says on it, a piece of rail rolled at Workington that's been chrome plated and turned into a, a paperweight. So uh, rail is always at the forefront of my mind. <laughs> um, I have vague recollections, Andrew. Was there a, a coated rail being developed at the time I retired uh, called Zintec? Zinoco. Oh, Zinoco, so, yeah, was it? We make, a, we make a coated rail now. So we talked about in the presentation a couple of degradation mechanisms. A less common one is corrosion. So high carbon steels don't have a particularly high... Um, corrosion rate out in the field like I say they can last 50 years but in certain locations you get very high corrosion rates level crossings for example they, they're quite um, salty wet environments they, th they throw a lot of salt down on the roads in winter and they it accumulates into the level crossing then you end up with um, them not drying out very well the sort of rubber porous pads the panels that you insert for the cars to roll over and you end up with a quite wet service in a corrosive environment that's conductive as well so you track signaling circuits you get stray current corrosion in these environments as well and and it's a big cost to, to the network is, is is the corrosion damage in locations like that also wet tunnels you know with constant wet service or acidic groundwater and also coastal track like you think uh, Dawlish around there uh, on the south coast where you get this, the winter named storms throwing salt spray all over the uh, 
uh, all over the, the track, it just increases the corrosion rate. So we, we developed a rail steel, well, it's not a steel, it's a coating called Zenoco. It's, it's an arc metal sprayed zinc rich alloy, mm -hmm. zinc and aluminium alloy. So we shot blast the rail, we spray arc spray this on to the coating and then we apply a, a sealer coat afterwards. And it, it's, um, it's a big seller for us, actually. It's, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's very popular. It's very high value pro product for us, although it's slowly putting us out of business because, of course, we're in the business of selling new rails. So <laughs> making the network last longer is uh, slowly destroying us. But there's demand there for these products. And if we don't make them, somebody will. So, yes, yeah, very good products in OCO. Uh, right. I've got some questions in the chat box now. Um, Dave Bruce has two questions. First off, what are typically main customer issues, problems with rail supply to customer mill when Teesside made rails? Um, 1972 to 2006. Main issues were cleanness, segregation and hydrogen. I think that probably still holds true. Um, you know, we, we've got a, a, a new, fairly new caster at, at Scunthorpe, Caster 4. It was built in 2000, I believe. And then it was modernized in about 2004 for, for rail. But it's, do, it does, it's done a million ton a year through it ever since. And it's starting to show its age now. But it's a good caster. Its segregation control is very good. It's got, um, it's not dynamic, but it does have some soft reduction on there. Um, Hydrogen we, we control with the vacuum degassing, but the, usually the first cast of a sequence, we can pick up some hydrogen from, from the mold, from the tun dish, et cetera. And we, we, we test the, the steel in the liquid form with, with the hydrous machine. And if, if it exceeds point, sorry, two parts per million hydrogen, then we will choose to slow cool that cast. So we cut the blooms off and we'll hot stack them uh, to, to slow cool them. If you hot stack them and put like a refractory lined cabin over the top of them, you can get the cooling rate down to something like one degree per hour. And that gives gives them time for the hydrogen to diffuse out. And then we, we test them in the solid, in the rail form then, and, and typically 0.3 parts per million after that treatment. It's, um, we have ways of managing the hydrogen now. Mm -hmm. uh, Dave's second question. Can you say how much more demanding customer specifications have become since Scunthorpe started rail production in 2006? So the specification changed a few times in, in that time. Um, straightness has, has certainly, straightness and twist tolerances have tightened. Um, dimensional tolerances, we mentioned, they've got, they've got more, much tighter. But the industry doesn't like change. <laughs> now it's standardised. They like to. Um, they don't like to introduce new grades. For example, it was. It's taken us, take us ten years to embed HP rail because it just adds additional complexity to a network that's already understood and, and established. It's. Um, I'm trying to think of some specific examples where it's changed. The qualification tests have got more demanding as well. So we do uh, tensile hardness, the normal run of the mill um, material release tests, but every five years we have to have a, a qualifying test document where you have to do fatigue tests and fatigue crack growth rate, and, and they're quite demanding. Some of the customers now insist that they're done by a third party. So we used to do them at R&D. They now insist some independent testing and it's got to be accredited to UCAS ISO 17025 laboratory, and there are very few laboratories that have got that accreditation for, for specific tests within this rail standard. So that that becomes challenging. But um, yeah. Am I actually uh, on, on voice, Sue? Uh, you can, can be, you... yes, Dave, carry on. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Dave. Well, uh, first of all, Andrew, thanks, thanks very much for a very good lecture. I thought it was very informative. Uh, you've answered my questions well. there, particularly the last one. Um, I was I was very interested really in um, things like hydrogen, because when I bowed out and when Teesside stopped making in 2006, hydrogen levels in the spec were kept becoming very more demand, very much more demanding. Um, so people it, like, it, people it, like India were, were, not yes, ex, so. were not accepting anything that was less than one and a half yeah. from, from the degasser. Uh, 
the uh, Indians as well. Like, for, for me, for Nick, I'd say separate, et cetera. Yep. And particularly on the segregation side, streaks, uh, particularly centre segregation, hinge cracks and things like that, become tighter and tighter. And I just wondered how far they had, they had got in the last 15 years. But it's, it seems a long time since 2006. <laughs> no, no, the Indians are still the most demanding spec in, in the world. So uh, 2.5 parts per million is the is the limit in the European spec for all grades, and it works well. We don't have hydrogen problems. In India, maybe 20, 25 years ago, they had a big derailment and a lot of people killed. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of people killed. It was a, it was a bit of a disaster. And when they did the investigation, they attributed the rail break that had caused the derailment and the fatalities down to um, hydrogen. It was hydrogen cracking within within some old rails. So to be seen to be doing something, they tightened the spec so they could say, well, we've now got the tightest spec for hydrogen in the whole world. And they they won't accept anything less than one, uh, more than 1.6 parts per million. But also they won't allow you to slow cool them if, if it does exceed that. So it becomes very, very expensive to, to make steel for, yeah, yeah, uh, for yeah. India. And the prices are, uh, frankly, they're crap anyway. So... And it's also a very protectionist market. So you do a lot of work developing a profile and, and talking to a customer. And then the government steps in at the last minute and says, no, we need this to be made in India. And, and India is a very difficult place to sell rails. But it is probably the world's biggest market with the most growth at the moment. But it's very, very difficult. And we've, we've, we've elected to not, to not sell rails in India. Right. That's interesting, that, because um, 15 years ago, it was America. It was, uh, it was America with Canadian, sorry, Canadian Pacific and Canadian National who were seeing yes. very tight hydrogen levels, and it was less than 2, two ppm that wanted then, which is uh, maybe a little bit of a step away. But the main interesting thing was it was, uh, it was zero streaks or, or zero segregation, which was almost impossible. Yeah, so Canadian National particularly. And again, they had a derailment in the National Park transporting um, oil and gas, you know, in, in these tank cars. A beautiful part of the National Park, you know, with a, with a, one of the world's best salmon fishing rivers running through it. And of course, they had a derailment that um, spilt a lot of oil into the into this beautiful National Park and ruined it. The, 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 the cleanup yeah, operation was yeah. just, just to set fire to it. You know, there was no other way to clean yeah. it up. It was yeah. just burn it. And, it was a big disaster for them. And of course, when they did the investigation, they found they attributed it to segregation. Absolutely, yeah, and yeah, and yeah, of course, they yeah. tightened the spec. You know, it's not just the Indians that have got this disease. So we have, um, in, you know, some customers are just incredibly demanding when it comes to segregation streaks they, with, with zero, almost zero tolerance. Uh, so we've put a lot of effort into that on our caster, just aligning the mold segments and making sure that right. we don't get any of that. that, that hinge cracking at the top and and you know we have good days bad days like anyone but our core home market the european market is, is relatively tolerant of it so uh, if we okay. want to go to america and we do we, we have developed a couple of uh, american rails this one is the latest one we're developing 115 re right currently yeah. developing that now for so we want to turn it into the united yeah. states though it's a very protectionist place yeah with the Trump tariffs and everything, but certainly Brazil and Canada, uh, Mexico, they use a lot of, of these rail profiles and we need to meet the uh, segregation requirements. So it's, 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 a, it's a concern and it might require a new caster. That's what, that's what we're looking at. The caster is, like I say, a million tons a year for the last um, 20, 20 years. It's, 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 uh, it's had some ammo. So a new caster might not be a, a bad shout. So what would be the things that you would look for in a new caster that you're not getting a the scones or caster at the moment? It, it's, it would be specifically for the ARIMA specification and the segregation. So it would be, more, you know, uh, alignment of your mold segments and making sure you've got very good control of, of hinge cracking. Uh, yeah. I, I, yeah, thanks for that. Biggest, you still use the Is the well, we, still used? Yes, on, on rail yeah. steel, yes. Yeah, yeah okay. Okay. Thanks, Andrew. That's very no good. No problem. Yeah. And thanks okay. again for a good presentation. Yeah, any time. Yeah. Any time. It's been a pleasure. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, I've had a request from uh, one of our members if they could have a copy of your presentation. Would that be possible? Uh, yes, but I think, Sue, you've recorded it, haven't you? For the I have recorded it, yes, and the, the recording will be on our YouTube channel. Um, 
I mean, if you don't mind sending me a, a PDF of the presentation, I can pass it on to the. There's the nothing. Concerned. There's nothing confidential in there, so I'm happy to happy to send it on. Please, if you would, that would be good. No Thanks problem. very much. Uh, anyway, uh, I'd like to thank Andrew for a, an excellent presentation. Obviously, aroused quite a bit of interest, especially amongst those of us who uh, used to work in the uh, steel industry. Um,